welcome. It is a pre 4th of July edition of the Terry's Talking Podcast. We're taping this on Monday the 3rd. Uh, I'm David Campbell, sports manager at cleveland.com, joined as I am every week by Terry Pluta, award winning columnist from the Plain Dealer and cleveland.com. And Terry, it's, uh, we were talking last week about your appearance uh, down at the library in Alliance, right? Yeah. And, and, and it, it was, uh, sounds like it was a great night. Yeah, packed house. And it was nice. So, uh, uh, Coach Karras came out with his wife, uh, uh, Linda, and it's really nice when you have a Hall of Fame coach in your audience. So when we had questions about quarterbacks and all that, I just said, well, Coach Karras, tell me about that. <laughs> the interesting one was this, because a uh, guy asked about the Browns don't seem to make halftime adjustments and all this, and I was watching him kind of bite through his lower lip sitting there. So I just said, uh, hey, Larry, and um, what can you really do at halftime? And he said, you got to think about it. You've got probably less than 10 minutes to do anything. He says, by the time you get your team in and get them back out. Um, he said, so if you haven't done most of your work during the week, you're in big trouble. You could maybe sub out one or two guys. You could maybe change a kind of a coverage or something to something else that you're doing. But in terms of anything big or any great motivational things, uh, it just doesn't fly. Of course, Larry Karras, the legendary coach at Mount Union. How many, boy, how many national championships in Division Three did think, they win I when he was there? I think it's nine. But the real stat is he coached more years than he lost games. Wow. It's something like 23 to 21. Um, so that's that was a big deal. But it was – and then we talked about quarterbacks. And he said, yes, a certain amount of arm strength is important. But he said when he's scouting a quarterback, he starts with accuracy. He says because if he's not accurate, um, it's really – that's hard to teach that. And so that was – I believe that's known as the Deshaun Kaiser principle, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it really is. He looks like a quarterback. (laughs) He's got the arm like a quarterback. And to a lesser extent, it hurt Brady Quinn, uh, accuracy also. So those are – that was nice. We had a great time there and – I could bring Larry Karras anytime he wants to come to my thing. I could just like, we could just do it together, especially with the football questions. So. Yeah, go on tour <laughs> across the state of Ohio. So, so Terry, real quick before we forget, I do want to mention that you have another appearance coming up a week from tomorrow, which is July 11th, a Tuesday, and that is going to be at 6 o'clock at the Lake Community Library. That's at 565 Market Street, and that is in Uniontown. So um, sign up for that if you haven't already. You can just go to the library website. And do it there. And also, before I forget, Terry, we should mention your newsletter uh, comes out every week, I believe, on Mondays. And if you are out of town or even just a big Terry Pluto fan, it's a great way to keep up with everything that Terry is writing. So, um, all right, let's get into some baseball. Okay. We'll start with the Guardians. Anything else I'm missing there to get us going? I think we're ready. All right. Um, So... There's an old saying, Terry, in farming, what uh, the corn needs to be uh, four foot high by the 4th of July or something, and the, the Guardians are in a first place tie by the 4th of July yeah. in the division. So everything that's going on with this team, it seems like the stage is set and everything is kind of out there for them at this point of the season. Uh, we've seen the offense pick it up, a, a real good road trip in Chicago and Kansas City. Mm-hmm. And, I don't know. Give us a state of the Guardians as you see them right now. I think their record is real close to what it was a year ago at this time, one or two under 500. And the difference is I just don't see them. I think they won 24 of their last 32 games. I don't see them doing that because, among other things, you won't be playing that many Central Division teams. And, and But flip side, I don't see anybody else in the Central being all that great either. Minnesota's got half their team on the injured list. You know, the White Sox have all this talent, but, I mean, you're a Chicago guy. Tell me, what's going on there with them? Who knows? Every year it's something different. I mean, last last year it was La Russa, right? And now mm-hmm. it's, it just seems like it's always something. They can never get it put together. And I just don't think they're as built – they're not as – as fundamentally built as the guardians are in terms of an organization, the stability um, in, in, in manager and just the way their franchise is built. They don't have the culture that the guardians have. It's another reason to appreciate what Cleveland's got going right here. I think. And well, one of the discussions I've had with some fans and that is that, well, like the central division is really bad and there's no denying that. And the national league central is not very good either. It's a little better, but not much. But if you look at the teams in those 
two divisions. You got Chicago teams in each, which is a major market. But the rest of the teams in those divisions, frankly, are teams that you would think market size should be playing each other. And that does matter a lot more in baseball than it does the other sports because of a lack of salary cap. So I look at it that way. It might be the one way baseball does even it out a bit with its teams. It sets the teams in the central, both of them, in a better spot to, you know, make the um, – the playoffs and some others. That's why Tampa, what Tampa Bay does is just remarkable. Um, nonetheless, so it's an it's an interesting thought uh, on that regard. So, all right, I'll start with you, uh, David. What did you expect them to be at this point? Uh, right around here, I really did. Mm-hmm. Like it, it, we we see Terry Francona's teams start out slow, usually in April and May, and then as the season goes along, they get more and more consistent. They figure out roles. They figure out uh, how they want to play, if, if there's any doubt about that. And they, and they just – they get better as the season goes along. And I, that's kind of what I expected at this point. I mean, some fans say, well, they must not be prepared right in spring training, you know, things like that. The Guardians just have a different way of doing business, among other things, is uh, the April and Th- Cleveland theory, and which tends to play out. A really young player – Opens the season when Cleveland, for the most part, he doesn't do very well unless he's been there. You know, they like the idea of bringing these guys up once the season opens. I mean, for example, they knew that Tanner Bybee and Gavin Williams had just about better arms. I would say better arms than probably anybody on the staff, you know, raw talent. And uh, Bieber, obviously, is a far more accomplished pitcher. Um, McKenzie at that point, you know, had, had a lot more going, but you just look at them throw. They also know that their experience was limited and that they wanted them each to uh, just have some AAA experience before they brought them up and pitch well so that they're ready to go. And that's especially true with Hithers. I mean, when you think about Jose Ramirez had a pretty good year in 2014 when he came up. At, he originally made the team in 2013 in September. He was 21. So in 2014, he went back to the minors, was playing well. They called him up. He was playing shortstop, by the way, that year. They were waiting for Lindor. And then he finished strong. He opened the season in 2015, struggled, went back to the minors. It was April in Cleveland, as Francona would say. And then he came back later on that year and then 2016 is when he kicked into it in 300 and everything else. You could just go through, I mean, the whole line of ju- – I was trying to think of players on their roster. There's a few that haven't been to the minors simply because they haven't been in the majors that long. But no, that didn't go back to the minors, excuse me. But most of them, you know, made trips back to the minors. Jose Ramirez did and um, Rosario did and Naylor did. Uh, Straw did. You did McKenzie did. Uh, I don't believe Savali did. But you generally, they all go back at the stat is 85% of the guys. So the idea is have them ready to go, figure it out as you go along, because you just didn't load up with these big, you know, free agent acquisitions. I was trying to think, Terry, one of the only ones I can think of in terms of position players was maybe Francisco Lindor, and they waited until May or June to bring him up, if I remember, yeah. for the first time. Mm-hmm. That was back there. Kipnis is another one that didn't go back to the minors. I remember there weren't mm. too many. But I had a discussion with uh, Chris Antonetti, and he said, we haven't actually done it because I think it's around 85%. So I played with a couple of their rosters, and it kept coming up around that number right there that came up and stayed. Uh, and that's just how it is. And, and baseball is so hard. I remember uh, Francona talking about he thinks uh, a hitter needs a minimum of 1,000 at-bats in the minors to be ready to go. Now, some guys – you are able to, to jump over that, that rope, but not too many. And you just said it's too hard of a game to just come up and and master it as quickly as that. So that's that's the big picture. Now when you look at the team, I mean look at what um you look at what Josh Naylor is doing now, and I think that he has been the key to the revival. Uh because along with I'm looking up right now as we are talking exactly where he stands in in the league and RBIs. But, you know, he is when he started to hit, 
all of a sudden they couldn't pitch around Jose. And if they did, he made them pay. And all of a sudden, my goodness, he's got 60 RBIs. He's fifth in the American League. And you want to just get that over with about Joshua being on the All-Star team and nobody knows. Yeah, let's talk about that, Terry. So the All-Star teams have been announced, the the starters and the reserves. And, you know, living in Cleveland, fans here wanted to see Josh Naylor get a bid. 10 home runs, 60 RBIs, like you mentioned. I think his OPS is 815, mm-hmm. if I remember. And yeah. he's he didn't, got, he didn't get a spot. Jose Ramirez did and uh, Emmanuel Classe. But first base, boy, I mean, that is a tough, tough position to make the all-star team. Yeah, it You've is. You've got some big, big names there and big numbers. I mean, Yandy Diaz is going to be the starter. And look, I mean, 318, 12 homers, 914 OPS, former Cleveland player. And then Vlad Guerrero is was the, the reserve who was selected. And, you know, 12 home runs, 52 RBIs, 792 OPS. He's got a name. He's, mm-hmm. it's, I think it's his third all-star appearance. So, I mean, you're going against someone who has a, more of a reputation and more longevity than Josh Naylor does. So, I, Terry, you wouldn't really say that Josh Naylor was overlooked. I mean, it's a shame he didn't make it, but I don't think you could probably bump those two guys out, or would you? Um, probably not, but, you know, you, there's other spots on the roster. Maybe he makes it anyway. We'll see if somebody gets hurt or doesn't go. But th- his stats scream all-star. And I'm looking – here's one of the nice things about Jose – I'm sorry, about Josh Naylor, and it's a little like Jose. He doesn't strike out that much. He's got 49 strikeouts. Doesn't walk that much, 18. He's got 49 strikeouts. I know he loves to run. I know he's a hockey player, but he makes me nervous every time he goes <laughs> to steal bases because he's flying in there head first. He's throwing his wrist out, and I'm always afraid his hand's going to get stepped on. He's going to jam a wrist or whatever. Uh, but he will tell you, you know, for my career, I've stole 14 bases, been caught only three times. He probably knows that stat. I'm just looking at that right there. And how about, you know, it just goes to show that, you know, their patience was needed with, with Josh Naylor. You know, he's 26 now. He's coming to his prime. But, you know, I look at like his first year when they made him, when they traded for him in 2020, he hit 230. Then uh, when he got hurt in, in back in 2021, he was batting 253 with seven homers. That was in 69 games. At that point, I'm thinking, well, he, you know, maybe he's a starter, maybe he's not. And then last year he comes back. You know, they put that leg back together at 20 homers and hit 256, 771 OPS. The nice thing is, I I had this in my notes over the weekend uh, from like July 1st of uh, 22 until July 1st of 23 that covered about 130 games he's played. And I think he had like 26 homers and 95 RBIs and OPS uh, almost 800. That's a, that's a strong sample size. Now this guy's a good player. Yeah. And you know, Terry, like you said, you can have all-star stats and not be an all-star. And I think that's what we're looking at here. The other thing that makes it a little dif- difficult. Do you know who the DH is for the American league? Hmm. Shohei Otani. Oh, yeah. What are you going to do? <laughs> so, yeah. So it's it's a tough one. And I think Josh Naylor, people know him now. And, man, Terry, that, that at bat that he had yesterday in at the end of the game, yep. a, lot of, a lot of guys get hot and they try to yank it out of the park every time. He just drove that right up the box, right up mm-hmm. the middle. That was what they needed at that point. And I just thought that was just a, a lovely at bat for him to take that and realize – you know, I'm going to get get a pitch I can hit and just drive it hard somewhere. I'm not going to try and pull it or whatever. That's that just shows you where his head is at as a hitter right now. I really I really thought that was good. And especially they always talk about when Josh Nay was swinging and the helmet goes flying. Uh, that's a bad sign. And with that hockey mentality, as you said, you know, growing up in Ontario, he <laughs> he kept those slow rollers. Is he looked like the you know like it's just. A, a secret service guy wanting to wrestle them to the ground or something. I mean, he just, he just could not get his glove and his hands and everything working together. I have to admit the the little bit I did play first base in high school, although I was primarily second base, my filled in some or whatever. I loved it. I thought it was much easier than second base, but that play right there where it's kind of in no man's land, where they take it for the second baseman or not, you've got runners going. It is awkward and what to do. And he showed you how awkward it is. But you turn around now and you look at their three and four hitters. So now you have Jose, Jose she's 873 OPS, 293, 
13 and 52. He stole on nine bases. And then you have Naylor right after that. And you can't just say, boy, that lineup really stinks. It doesn't stink anymore. It doesn't hit a lot of home runs, but it's starting to, you know, have some punch to it. They're starting to score some runs. We'll see how they do against the Braves. Um, I thought it was very encouraging to see uh, Jimenez hit the home run, then hit a double to center field because uh, they were just looking for him to hit the ball harder. And he could have a he could have a good second half. Yeah, and Bo Naylor has added some offense to the bottom half of the lineup too, mm-hmm. which is a big change. So, um, what, hey, no, Terry, what do you what do you yeah, thought about him defensively, Bo? Pretty good, right? I think we touched mm-hmm. on this last week. I think he's been good. I think the pitchers are getting used to him, and I, I think he looks pretty good back there. Yeah, that three sixty, a... that three hundred and sixty degree spin yeah. that he did. Like, I don't know that I've ever seen that by anybody. No. <laughs> it was but, really something. I mean, he's an athlete uh, that's catching, and I just. Really am excited to see that, uh, what he's going to become. Look, if he hits 220 or whatever as a rookie, that's good. You just needed to get – you know, I really think the whole Zanino thing was hanging over them. Uh, the, the clubhouse too. Players are watching the same game we're watching. Pitchers are, are seeing this, that uh, these balls are bouncing back to the screen. If I throw that thing, I don't trust he's going to do it. And then – they're thinking the same thing we were. Zanino's coming up to the plate. He's striking out over 40% of the time. He's going to strike out. I mean, they watched the same game. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's why they probably were as in favor of looking at Bo as the rest of us. And let's just see what Bo does. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm glad they did it. And also, you need to get you know, your first-round picks kind of into the, into the flow here. So I had some stats on Naylor about he had over like 550 at bats and AAA, and I think it was 260 batting average, but the OPS was over 800, and he had like 26 home runs. Okay, that's that's get you going, and you brought him up so it's not April in Cleveland, and let him go. And Cam Gallagher, by the way, I thought it was really unfair. They named him with they hit him with two pass balls in that game the other night the second pitch like almost hit the tore off the, the hitter's kneecap I don't know what they were watching there Colossae had no idea where that ball was going yeah I we could do a whole show on the scoring of games yeah. Terry like that ball that fly ball that Stephen Kwan and Miles Straw miscommunicated on where a fan yelled I got it from yeah. the stands at Wrigley and they dropped it like that should not be a single or whatever it was a single or it was a yeah. double that shouldn't be a double like, but it is because, you know, nobody touched it. So yep. uh, the pitchers get sailed with a lot of this stuff. And and anyway, like I said, that's a topic for another day. Mm-hmm. But, um, hey, we got a really interesting question here. I wanted to run past you. You talked about Gavin Williams earlier, um, came up, uh, boy, three, four weeks ago. This question is from Bob Sigsworth from Bath Township, Ohio, and he wants to get your thoughts on this, Terry. He says, hey, Terry, I'm right there with you on Gavin Williams' phenomenal mound presence for a guy his age making a second big league start. In that way, his build, his mound presence, his throwing form, does he remind you at all of Gaylord Perry? He does me. Maybe it's because I know they're both from North Carolina. Thanks for continuing to keep us informed and entertained and giving us lots to think about. Again, that's from Bob Sigsworth in Bath Township. Uh, what do you think, Terry? Any any comparisons you see between Gavin Williams and Gaylord Perry, the legendary multi-decade pitcher? I saw him pitch. I interviewed Gaylord, and I would say a little bit, yes. I mean, Gavin is a little burlier, but Gaylord had this presence on the mound. And you always say, well, he threw his spitter. He threw hard. He threw everything out there. And on top of that, he was from eastern North Carolina. Uh, and East Carolina is, which is in Greenville, North Carolina, North Carolina, uh, is where Gavin went to school. And so that that's where he hit into the, what was the old tobacco country back then. Uh, I worked in Greensboro for a year, so I kind of know the state a little bit. And so that's, there are some similarities there. Boy, if he becomes two-thirds of Gaylord Perry, uh, we're going to love that. First of all, if he's Gaylord Perry, you never have to go to the bullpen because Gaylord Perry, <laughs> would, especially as he got older, he would not leave the game. I mean, the manager would go, I, I, I'm not leaving. And I'm calling this up now just so you know I'm not totally full of hyperbole. Um, but in his – we'll just go like the whole career. His whole career, he started 
770, no, 690 games, and he completed 303. When he was that no, when he was with the tribe in, in 72, he started 41 games and completed 29. Then the next year, just to prove it wasn't a fluke, he started 41 games and completed 29, including seven shutouts. Uh, uh, you'll like this. A couple of the uh, guys that I knew on that team, Manning was on that team, Kuiper, they told me that how when Gaylord pitched, he would tell them, I don't care what kind of team you are the other four days, but when I'm pitching, we're a good team, and I expect you to play like we're a good team because I'm going to pitch like we're a good team. And he had that cold stare that he would give you. But it's like he really did – you really hear a – you'll hear a team will respond to a pitcher kind of the way he pitches. But also there was the presence that Gaylord had that rolls up those rather mediocre teams in the middle 70s to when he pitched um, – you know, it was it was a different ball game. So if Gavin Williams is two thirds of that, boy, they got something special. Boy, yeah. When Gaylord quit pitching, the the uh, supply chain for petroleum jelly got a lot. I know a he, lot looser, didn't it? It was a lot more yeah, available when and, he was done. He used to lot, put it everywhere. <laughs> he told me too when I was interviewing. He said he never denied. He would just be coy about it. He goes, but sometimes I'd go out there. He goes, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have anything on my hair. But I'm like touching the back of my hair, where just to kind of freak everybody out, and the you know the umpires yelling at him, the hitters are yelling, and you know he would just he was uh, really playful with that. But um, what a what a phenomenal thing, you know. The I remember it was a huge deal in 1972, right before that season, when uh, Cleveland traded Sam McDowell, who was you know a phenomenal younger pitcher, pitcher. But at that point, Sam was deep into alcoholism. He's talked about this openly. And his career was going down, and they brought in, at, at that point, Gaylord Perry was 33. And I remember Gabe Paul, who made that trade, uh, said that Gaylord will be much better, pitch much longer than Sam will, which I think Sam was in his late 20s. And, of course, that turned out to uh, be correct because he was 33 at the time of the trade, and he pitched until he was 44. And he adapted the way he pitched as he went along. Oh, yeah. He went, he Everything went changed, and yeah. Yeah. So that so that was fun. So yeah, we'll we'll go for. That. I'm very curious to see. You know, as we're talking about this, Gavin's getting ready to take the mound tonight mm-hmm. against the, the um, Braves. Even if he gets knocked around, it doesn't really bother me. I'd like to see him pitch well, but I just want to see more of him. I haven't seen an, a full kind of arm like that with the Guardians. A little bit with Jarrett Wright when he came up, but Jarrett did not have the breaking ball, or I think the poise that. Um, Gavin, I guess Jarrett was a high school pitcher that came out quickly, but kind of a burly guy that's strong. That was that was Jarrett. That's an interesting comparison, Terry. Yeah. Um, all right, we got one last one. We're kind of looking ahead here, Terry. The, the trade deadline is coming up on August 1st. I wanted to throw out this question real quick from Neil in Jamestown, New York. He says, hey, Terry, at this point of the season, the Guardians look like a 500 team to me. The problem is 500 might win the division. That makes the buy-sell calculus more difficult at the trade deadline. Your thoughts? Guardians are going to be buyers, right? They'll probably do it in a very measured way like they usually do and and see what's out there, correct? I think they'll try to make a trade for Bieber, much like they did for Clevenger. Uh, help now and some prospects for later. And because they're, we've mentioned this before, but I just want to keep underlying it. You know, agents are so important. And when we come to our Cavs segment, I want to talk about that, too. It's a, it's a thing. There was an agent that was a, very strong in a play to help the Cavaliers. But in this case, the agent is Drew Rosenhaus, the famed NFL agent, who has an assistant that he had hired from the Scott Boros agency to run his baseball uh, operation. If you go to the Drew Rosenhaus website and then you click on the baseball thing, there's a big picture of Bieber. At least there was the last time I looked. And, you know, he's their prime client that they're using to build their baseball operation. And they can't turn around and just have him sign a rather what maybe some people would consider a modest contract. They're going for the home run with this. In the same way, David Meter, who is trying to build up his career as an agent for Francisco Lindor, he was going for the home run. Now, knowing that, if you're Chris Antonetti and Mike Chernoff, you're going to make sure. Um, you don't get stuck with just trying to trade him a year from now, excuse excuse me, at the end of this season. I mean, the 
the Guardians know how they traded Lindor in the middle of that uh, season or before 2020. They probably would have gotten more than they did, you know, afterwards. So I, I think they will. And besides, David, I keep looking at their minor league system. I don't see an outfielder that can hit in the upper levels. I don't want to hear about George, George Valera. He's got to play two months without getting hurt. I mean, he's, he's got to. You know, we want to bring up Oscar. You know, that's been my thing. Second year in a row, bring, bring up Oscar. But platoon him. But I'm not sure Oscar is, you know, that the, the next Josh Naylor or something. Boy, how about saying that? <laughs> the next Josh but it's Naylor. It's true, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, but they had, they had to go trade for Josh Naylor. And they got to go trade for somebody else, a younger form of Josh Naylor. And Bieber is a guy that could bring you that and some other things. And just for to refresh everybody's memory, uh, Shane Bieber's making about ten million this year. He has one year of arbitration in twenty twenty four, and then he's an unrestricted free agent in twenty twenty five. So, the clock is ticking in terms of what the Guardians can get back. So, all right, Terry, we'll take a break here. Um, when we come back, we're going to get into the Cavs free agency. We're going to maybe we'll grade the free agency and and see what we uh, would assign as a grade for what the Cavs have done. And then we're going to get into a discussion. I want to ask Terry what he thinks the toughest GM job there is in sports, pro sports, baseball, hockey, football, basketball, NBA. Um, and I want to hear what Terry has to say about that. So we'll get into that and more when we return on Terry's Talking. Hey guys, if you love college football, we think you'll like the College Football Survivor Show. I'm Doug Maurice and my co-host Shahan Jeharaja and I, each week we talk about the best programs, best coaches, best players in the sport. It's all football, no off-field stuff, no legislation. It's about the teams that are going to matter most in the playoff race. Will Georgia three-peat? Always on the lookout for angry Bama. The Big Ten, Ohio State and Michigan battling at the top and Penn State on the rise. The Pac-12 matters again, not just USC, but Oregon and Washington as well. The playoff is expanding. Expand your podcast listening try the college football survivor show wherever you find podcasts we're back on terry's talking david campbell and terry pluto uh terry we got a question last week and i didn't get it into our podcast from our longtime listener and friend of the pod kathleen thompson and she says hey terry what is the greatest need for the Cavs this offseason and that, like i said kathleen sent that in before free agency happened and then free agency happened and the Cavs seems like they got a lot done, right? Karis LeVert has been brought back on a two-year, $32 million deal. Uh, They sent Jetty Osmond and Lamar Stevens out of town to get Max Struess on a four-year, $63 million deal. Sharpshooter, 27 years old. Then they have made some other deals with uh, George Niang coming in. And um, I'm forgetting the other one. Oh, Ty Jerome, a $5 million deal. And Damian Jones from the Jazz. So this is kind of a roster makeover without touching the core players. And I guess if you have to grade this, Terry, I know you're hearing a lot from fans who are like, they got to do something big. They got to do something big. And they didn't do something big, which you wrote about, but that's okay. Right? Like what grade would you give what they did with what assets they had? Probably a B plus, you know, I mean, because none of these guys you say for sure that plugs in the um, small forward hole. They're hoping Struess can do that, but we'll have to see because he's a little small at 6'5". But here's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, You know, Struess last year, actually, he only uh, shot 35% on three-pointers. And that's very close to what Isaac Okoro shot. But what's the difference? What do you think, Mike? Uh, What do you think, David, is the difference between that? Well, I would venture to say that 90% or more of all of Okoro's three-pointers came from the corner. Mm-hmm. And if you watch Struess, he's, 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 he does more than that. He can shoot it from anywhere. And I think he's also really good at coming off screens and shooting it. Those are my two things. Am I wrong? <laughs> uh, close. Actually, they're both right around 36%. Uh, yes, Struess is more there. But here's the other factor. Defenses don't think Okoro's going to make the shot. Even if they're shooting the same number, they're not going to pay attention to them. But when they prepare for Miami back then, where Struz started, by the, last, by the way, the last two years, Miami played in 41 playoff games. Struz started them all. He didn't start all during the regular season, but he started them all in the playoffs. That tells you what uh, Pat Riley and, and Eric Spolster thought of the guy. When the games were tough, they wanted him to play. 
I mean, it's interesting. Like the regular season, he started only 33 of the, of the 80 games he played in, but he starts all the playoff games. So because they feel he um, will attract attention that he might make three-pointers. See, that's part of it, too, when you're facing another team. Will they respect the three-point shot being taken? And I also think, too, that Orcoro in the playoffs fell into a little bit of, uh, I missed one or two, and it felt like I missed ten. And so he didn't want to take them. Struess will keep jacking them up, better or worse, but he'll keep taking them. So that's, I mean, you're, you're right about the other stuff. But the big thing I just will believe is, and I was just thinking about this, they didn't believe Okoro would make the shot even when he was making the shot. Yeah, and just on reputation alone, mm-hmm. like that, that that can dictate defense. Uh, the other thing I didn't mention about Struess, I think he's not bad on in the transition game. I think he can get down the floor, run the floor, mm-hmm. and he's not just a spot-up shooter. Like he can finish at the rim on the break. Like um, if you catch a team in slow transition defense, I think he can get to the basket and and make a few different shots down there as opposed to somebody who's just a spot up three. So he'll bring that too. Screws yeah. had a miserable uh, finals. Yeah, I think he shot 28% from the field, like 22 on threes against Denver. He had a very good uh, final four game where they were final four matchup with Boston. He was over 40% from the field and on threes. And keep in mind, anything above 40% on threes is excellent. So that's a really good thing. And that takes me to, uh, Niang. Did I say that right? Yeah, Niang. Yep. Niang. All right. You know what his nickname is? I don't. What is it? The minivan. Oh. Uh. And do you want to? I did investigative reporting. Why Let's is hear he the story. called the minivan? He played four years in Utah and he played there with Donovan Mitchell. And I guess one time he's being interviewed. And about Donovan or whatever and him. And all of a sudden, George says, well, you know, Donovan's like a Ferrari. And compared to him, I'm kind of like a minivan. <laughs> and it's stuck, the minivan. So because you'll see Nying is very good at one thing, shooting. The rest of the game, the rest of the, his game leaves uh, to be desired. But here is a guy in um, – Last year, he shot, you know, 44% from the field, 40% on threes. And just about all the shots he takes are three-pointers. I mean, he fires these babies up. He took 500 shots from the field and 380 were three-pointers. So that's what he, you know, he, and 53% on corner threes. So he's a shooter. He's not very good defensively. But they would need this. Now, I do think he's another one when you would be facing the Cavaliers with him and the minivan comes in the game and goes to the corner, all the scouting reports would scream, you better uh, guard this guy because he's been in the league seven years and he's, he shoots exactly 40% on three-pointers. And I'm looking at it the last five years where he's been a, a semi-regular. He's never shot under 40% on threes. So – that's an important thing. I think that was a really uh, under-the-radar signing that will help them because they wanted guys to go in there that just demand that teams cover them. And then uh, I had some background conversations with some top people at the Cats, and they also said guys that uh, – they talked about adding volume to their threes. They, just, they, they wanted somebody else besides – Donovan and Garland just jacking up threes. And there really wasn't anybody else on the roster. They liked doing it very much. Now they feel with these two guys, uh, at least they got a chance to uh, put the ball in the basket from long range sometimes. Oh, yeah. During the series against the Knicks, Terry, I mean, the Cavs, they sure could have used a minivan on the outside. Yeah. They, they would have settled for a Pinto or a Yugo, anything with four wheels and an engine that could make a three-pointer uh, once or twice in a game. So this will be a big upgrade, I think. Yeah, I'm I'm curious to see how it is. Now, here's an interesting part of this whole deal. There's an agent named Mark Bartlestein, and I've known Mark since the late 80s. He was a very young lawyer and just starting the agent business when he became hooked up with John Hot Rod Williams. At that point, Hot Rod was um, unfairly and wrongly attached to the Tulane point-shaving scandal. 
The Cavs, Harry Weltman took him in the second round, knowing he might even have to sit out a year. So Bartlestein was the one who they brought in a top Chicago lawyer. Bartlestein's out of Chicago, named Mike Green, who went in. This was, I always thought this had been a great made-for-TV movie. And he basically blew a whole lid off the case and how several players on the Tulane team were using drugs and in with the drug dealers. They were doing the point shaving. They all pointed to hot, they cop please and pointed to Hot Rock because he was a star to try and get uh, off. By the way, the, the DA in that case was Henry, uh, Harry Connick Sr. Uh, really? Son, yeah, the son is the, I mean, this would be a great movie, uh, whose son was the, uh, you know, the, the singer. So Bartlestein goes back to the Cavs way back in the old days with Hot Rod, and he represented, other, he represented uh, Larry Nash Jr., and I think he also has uh, the, other, the younger Nance. So we've got that, and he was the agent for Max Struess. They had to work a three-way deal because they couldn't do it with salary cap and that. They brought in San Antonio on the trade, and that's where Chetty Osmond and Lamar Stevens went in that deal to make this all work. Well, to, oftentimes to make these three-way deals go through, you need an agent with connections and understands cap. So he was the agent for Struess. He helped that deal go through. He represents the minivan. And so – and. You know, it was three years, twenty-six million. You go, that's a lot of money. I was figuring it out with the salary cap approaching something like one hundred thirty million. The average salary is pretty close to ten million a year in the NBA. Say fifteen guys, one hundred thirty million. Do the math. Okay, <laughs> he has those two, and that guy Ty Jerome, a, a, a backup guard they signed, also a Bartlestein client. Now, I'm not saying he's just doing Cavs favors, but there are times when agents work better with certain teams. And remember when Larry Nash Jr. was traded? It was a quiet deal where at that point Larry Nash Jr. was frustrated because he felt that the Cavs were never going to be in the playoffs. You know, he just got ping pong balled out, as I called it. So he asked Mark Bartlestein to go to the Cavs and see if they could work a deal, which ended up being that complicated trade the market in here and then Bartlestein talked to me to explain that the Cavs didn't just dump out on the home home homegrown guy uh that Larry Nance Jr. really wanted this and it was kind of everybody got together and made it happen um and so that's stuff to keep in mind and I think it helped the Cavs in this situation to have a good working relationship and also see certain agents with certain teams uh, they just may not like that team or just think it's poorly run and they don't want to go there and they'll push their clients somewhere else. Well, this is a good bridge here. I know you wanted to talk about the Damian Lillard trade request where, boy, a month ago we're hearing, oh, they met. The the Blazers say they're going to make some moves and, and make them a playoff team and he hasn't asked to be traded and now he's asked to be traded. So yeah. um, that's kind of the big story in the NBA right now in terms of where he's going to end up. And Tim Bielek, uh, our colleague, just put up a post on five potential landing places for him. So we'll see how that all comes together. But um, this, this is a little reminiscent of the Kyrie Irving situation here in Cleveland. But what did you think of the Damian Lillard situation and what it says about the NBA and all this stuff about agents and, and how the league runs? Well, if he wants to be traded, he's got every right to ask to be traded. He's also under contract for like four more years. So they don't have to trade him. The interesting thing is he doesn't just want to be traded. He wants to be traded to Miami. Now, do you think, and I'll throw it back at you, Dr. Campbell, do you think that just because Damian Lillard put in 11 good years and was a good soldier and all that in Portland and all that's true, that they should acquiesce and not just trade him, but trade him to Miami? No. I, I just I, – I don't see – this is a business, and this is the way it works. If you lock into that long-term deal, you give that up. I mean, mm -hmm. unless it's written in your contract that you have a no-trade clause, uh, the team has to do what's best for the team. And if you don't want to go somewhere else other than Miami, sorry. Like, that's – it's business. It's not personal. And deal with it. So that's where I'm at with it. Yeah, and now a good agent – let me go back to that. I don't know who represents Lord. Uh A good agent – now we'll work with Miami, and we're there and try to make this deal happen. And Miami, part of the reason they let Struess walk and some of the other moves they're making 
if they were piling up salary cap room to go after Lillard or possibly James Harden because they want to add another star. And so this is one of those things, too. Like if you're an agent, say, look, you're already making moves to try and make this happen. Um, my guy wants to go there. If you make X, Y, and Z, that's, in other words, a good agent could be a go-between. A bad agent could just say, I'm going to make Lillard sit out and all this other stuff. I, 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 when the Cavs met with Kyrie Irving and his agent, this is when Kyrie had wanted to be traded. That is where, in that meeting, you know, Kyrie, first of all, said, I want to be the focal point of a franchise, you know. Secondly, he said, you know, my knee's been bothering me for quite a while, and if I don't get traded, I'm going to get knee surgery. And that's it. I'm sitting out. So at that point, Dan Gilbert and uh, Kobe Altman said, let's just see there. But I, I know that Kyrie Boston may not have been his first choice. That's where he ended up going. Um, and, of course, the interesting thing on that, David, if you remember by the end of that year, he ended up getting knee surgery because he really was hurt. And, of course, that starts a string of franchises that Irving has messed up. If you go <laughs> to, to Boston, they were better without him than with him. Then you go to Brooklyn, and, you know, he tries to do the super th thing with team with Durant and all that, and that was an unmitigated disaster there. At one point, remember, they had Harden, Kyrie, and Durant for about five minutes. That was that was awful. Then he goes to Dallas. Their record was better without him than with him. And now he's staying there. Now he's staying there because his market wasn't as big. So, but the NBA is is an odd league because sometimes remember in the middle of the season they'll just tell guys to to go sit at home while I try to work out a buyout or a trade for you. I mean, see, yeah, it's crazy. The team, I mean, will, the team will do it. Well, we were talking about this the other day, Terry. This is why I think the NBA is the hardest league mm -hmm. to be a GM in. And I know, I, I think you said you thought baseball mm -hmm. was tougher. And we can spend a couple minutes talking about that. But I mean, you look at these situations, you're, you're right. A good agent leaks that the guy wants out. And what yeah. does that do? It puts the team in a bad spot, takes away all the team's leverage. Mm -hmm. And now they got to dump your player. And it's you don't see that in hockey or even I think some of the other sports to the extent you do in the NBA where – it is such a player dominated league because there's only five guys on the court at one time. It's a star driven league. The stars dictate, you know, the salaries and the, and the free agency and, and super teams. It's all player and, and agent based. The teams have very little control compared to the other sports. I just think it's so hard between that, the constraints of the salary cap, you get into one or two bad contracts, you're, you're up the Creek. And I just think the other sports are a lot more forgiving. I, I don't know. Maybe I, I'm not a GM, but it just seems like the NBA is just so wrought with headaches like this, and it never ends. It's so hard to win. It's really hard to win. And the other thing that uh, I want to mention, we're talking about good agents, bad agents, you know, like Mark Bartlestein, he did not make that known publicly or Larry Nance Jr. about wanting to be out until after the trade happened. Then he explained it to take the heat off of the Cavaliers. See, that's what, and in a sense, kind of put it on himself as much as Larry Jr. That is what a good agent does. Now you turn around and you look this time around when they, when Bartlestein had clients that they liked, they don't just run around signing Bartlestein clients, understand that, but there are ways that you, he can make it work. This will happen that Bartlestein had a whole bunch of shooters in his stable coming up as, as, as free agents. And so this was really good. They could get to work on this. And so that's that's my point, whereas some of these other guys, I remember Ben Simmons sat home. Remember that? I mean, it's nuts what goes oh, on. Oh, yeah. I mean, you're, you're absolutely right, Terry. The teams want to deal with the agents that they can trust and they know can help them do business in the right way. I mean, I was thinking about uh, Carlos Boozer's son is breaking out right now as a basketball yeah. So you remember what Carlos Boozer pulled on the Cavaliers? They, they let him out of his contract. And they were going to re-sign him. They let him out of his um, his uh, automatic pickup option year, yeah. and then he just left. <laughs> yeah, and and that was it's one like, of those two where um, you go back and by the way, the agent for that was Rob Polinka, who now, by the way, is he is a GM of the, the GM of the Lakers. Yeah, yeah. he would have been like being on the other end of that. <laughs> everybody blames everybody on that one, um, but you're correct in, in how business is done. And that's, it's that way. I mean, you talk about family relationships. Can I trust the uncle or the father on this? Or I can't, you know, or your business relationships, whatever the, the main thing is. 
Uh, what I do like, and I think this shows, is the Cavs do have a good reputation uh, around the league uh, to be able to make this work. Now, I want to ask you this. We see these now Phoenix is forming a super team. Now they have what? Bradley Beal, they have Durant, they have Booker, they have Aiton. Um, what super teams, when these got formed, actually worked of late? I could only think of one. I mean, are you talking about a big three or, or a big like, – Something like, like that. The, the Miami Heat worked. Yes. The, I would say that the Cavs worked. Yeah, although they were not quite as high profile, I guess, as, as this. Right. It, and, I mean, Golden State was homegrown. So, yeah. like, other than Durant coming in, right? So, you can't mm-hmm. really call them that. So, no. But you're right. There haven't been that many that have worked. Most of the time, it kind of uh, implodes. And – if you really want to talk about super teams that work, there's a common denominator. LeBron James. <laughs> he goes yeah, from Miami right. to Cleveland. How yeah. would you – you talked about how hard it is to be a GM. You might talk me in the NBA being the hardest GM as we're going along, place to be a GM. Um, how would you like to be in the East? For those eight years in a row, LeBron takes his teams to the finals. Eight. And, you know, you're in – Toronto, remember how what good teams they had, and they're getting knocked out. Boston had really good teams. Atlanta. Atlanta had good teams. One year, I thought Indiana looked terrific. And it didn't matter. You couldn't get past them. It, it, you know, LeBron was the one that was really, you know, driving that super team. It, it began, I'm not going to say began and ended with LeBron, but it was certainly LeBron driven. And so – which goes back to the fact that only five play in basketball versus nine or 10, if you want to count DH in baseball and 22 in football. And whereas, and as great as it is to have a quarterback, a quarterback doesn't play defense. Uh, whereas in basketball, he's on the court for everything. So you, my brain, am I winning you over to the basketball thing or you still think baseball? <laughs> the hard thing with Bob baseball is the rules are just unfair you know, with the, the salary cap and stuff. Uh, nonetheless, uh, probably the, I'll say this, whether you're a coach or you're a GM in basketball, that they have to lead the league in ulcers. I would say so. Yeah. I mean, all the divas, all that going on. Um, so, I mean, it's a wonderful league. They've had five champions in the last five years with five different coaches. Only one still has his job, Steve Kerr. Uh, By the way, I'm not counting Denver. Well, Denver is the fifth one, but all right, Malone still got his job. But you look at uh, uh, Milwaukee and and, and the Lakers and Frank Vogel now just hooked down with with Phoenix. Uh, Budenholzer's out there looking for a job. It's just – it's ridiculous. The league just chews up these people. They all get paid. We're not talking about poor guys, you know. First of all, if you're a really good, even assistant coach, by the time you reach the NBA level as a head coach, you're already a millionaire. So these guys are make, but it's still, it's like nobody likes being fired and nobody likes getting ulcers for no reason. Makes Greg Popovich all the more incredible when you yep. think about it. So the Bill Belichick of the NBA. So, um, hey, Terry, I, we, we're going to move on here, but I didn't want to mention uh, Amani Bates, who we talked about last week, the Cavs second round draft pick, uh, met the media for the first time today out at the, uh, Cleveland Clinic courts. And I thought this was really interesting. You know, it's kind of a fresh start. We talked about that last mm-hmm. week. He needs to kind of do things the right way. Apparently before the interview session, he went around and introduced himself individually to every reporter, which I thought was really interesting. Ooh. I don't know that I've seen many pro no. athletes do that. So uh, a very fascinating gesture from Monty Bates and it's something small, but I thought it was interesting nonetheless. So I just want to wanted to mention that well, somebody so. gave him good advice be it his agent or his uh, pr guy and i'm guessing it was probably his agent and that's wise you want to do that and make sure your assistant coaches know who you are and the old line you only have one chance to make a first impression truer words have never been spoken and uh, if you want to check out cleveland.com this evening chris fedor our colleague was out there covering that so be interesting to see what he has to write about that. So, all right, Terry, I did want to touch on your Gettysburg column for your faith in you column from the past weekend. Uh, you sent me an email about it was I think it was one of your most read faith in you columns of the mm-hmm. year. And, and your point about Gettysburg was that people today complain about, oh, the country's never been in worse shape. We've never been more divided. 
And I, it being the 160th anniversary yeah. of the Battle of, of Gettysburg, uh, your column kind of captured, hey, it's it's been way worse, and here's proof. Just go back and look at this battle as one example. Why do you think people were so um, compelled to read that Gettysburg column? And, and what is it about Gettysburg? Maybe if you could just spend a couple minutes talking about what it is about catches people's attention and, and interest. I think there's still a lot of Civil War uh I start to say fans or buffs, whatever you want to call it, they're out there. Um, Gettysburg has a special magic to it because it was fought on northern soil. I think that was the big, and that was the turning point because uh, had General Lee been successful and actually kind of been smarter, th- that whole thing could have changed because he did, let's put it this way, that was not Lee's best game plan. I talked about this. And meanwhile, uh, Abraham Lincoln, we would just call that the GM of the Union Army, it had been going, as I wrote, had been going through generals like the Browns did, coaches. <laughs> and he was on General Meade, who was his fifth in two years, who was appointed, given the job at three days before the battle hit. And he was woken up at three in the morning by a lieutenant who came from Lee's office, I'm excuse me, Lincoln's uh, office, and said, uh, General, I hate to tell you, but I have some troubling news from you. And he hands him the letter saying, you're now in charge of this army. So Meade Me- was able to kind of pull things together. He's sort of one of these journeyman generals back then. He had all kinds of different jobs and, and held off Lee. And I just think it's because it's in Pennsylvania. Uh, it went on for three days, July 1, 2, and 3. Uh, General Lee was very aware that this was happening on the 4th of July uh, in 1863, which was, I think, like something like 85 years or something since like the, the Declaration of Independence. And, you know, they were fighting their own form of that. And had this gone the other way, and the war went on for almost two more years, but still, uh, it would we'd be a much different country. And I am glad we have people who are sort of aware of the Civil War because I, I read a lot of stuff and it's just scary, the lack of uh, knowledge of basic history. So check it out. It's going around. I mean, I've written about the Civil War before. I've written two columns about Antietam. I wrote one, a whole different version of, of Getty Script column several years ago because it's I just think it's so symbolic of it being over the 4th of July weekend. But it, one of the big things there too is they just kept fighting, David. Like it wasn't bad enough the ten thousand or ten thousand casualties on day one. They came back at it in day two, and they came back at it in day three. And by the time General Meade was always uh, sort of accused of playing some form of prevent defense by not chasing Lee, his top of three of his top commanders have been killed, and there was just so much carnage and bloodshed and death. He just didn't feel he could go on. And so we this happened like in Pennsylvania. It didn't happen in Korea or um, in Japan or these other places where uh, wars have been fought. It happened right, you know, you could drive there in five hours. Well, and what's the what's the old saying here, uh, Terry? That uh, history it's a it's a cycle, right? It goes. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. happen it once. Recy- it comes it back in a recycles cycle. Recycles in different ways, and also, you know, those who don't understand history are doomed to repeat it. And so that's a another thing there. But my, my one of my big things, I just am so tired of the hyperbole in media about it's never been this bad. This is awful. This country's breaking apart. Now we're, we're at war with each other, you know, and some cultural things and that, but it's just, I'm sorry. We don't have blood bodies all over the streets. We don't have the, the, the union and Confederate armies taking over barns, turning them into hospitals. We don't have pile of bones out in front of uh, different doorsteps where everybody's having stuff amputated I mean, I could just go on and on. I mean, one of the things that was really awful after Gettysburg is for a month afterwards, uh, when you have so many dead bodies and things buried just close to the surface, was all the flies, all the disease, all that stuff that would have inflicted on the people that lived in Gettysburg. At least those are able to stay there because others had were burned out of their homes and everything else. Oof. All right. Well, li- yeah, li- the country literally did split apart before. Yep. So it's a great thing to keep in mind. So, again, check out that column. It was in The Plain Dealer on Sunday. And it was on cleveland.com on Saturday. So, all right, Terry, I think it's about time to wrap up. We do have a Hey Terry question that I did not fit in last week because we were running short on time. So I wanted to share this one. It is from Caleb Mackey from Columbus, longtime listener of the show. 
And he says, hey, Terry and David, I thought Terry's nobody asked me, but dot, dot, dot format was a perfect way to formulate a top 10 list of my favorite Plutoisms of the past few years. Mm -hmm. I figured if Terry can throw back to Jimmy Cannon, and the great sports columnist, then I can throw back to David Letterman. And so this is from Caleb. He says, number 10, nobody asked me, but dot, 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 if Case Keenum would have played more in Baker's last year, we would have made the playoffs. Number uh, nine. That nobody horse asked got dragged me. out of the stall one more time. Remember that? That's right. Number nine. Nobody asked me, but dot, dot, dot. I know people say three points are better than two, but two points are better than zero. Number eight. Nobody Irre asked me. But. I, well, let me make it irrefutable <laughs> math. Right. Basic math. Number eight. Nobody asked me, but. The Dolans are cheap is unfair and leads to fans not appreciating how, appreciating how great of a baseball franchise we have in Cleveland. Number seven, nobody asked me, but dot, dot, dot. Nick Chubb is the best running back to wear a Browns uniform since Jim Brown, which you've and, said many times. Terry. Yeah, I hear from the Leroy Kelly fans and Leroy was great. Uh, Chubb's better. Number six, nobody asked me, but dot, 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 if Case Keenum would have taken over the team in Bakers <laughs> last year, the Browns might have won the Super Bowl. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. I know. He made that one up. I Number know. five, nobody asked me, but dot, 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 Donovan Mitchell could be the best Cavs player to wear the uniform after LeBron James. Yes. you could, have said. Could be. And yes. And, and I, that's why this year is fascinating for them coming up. I think we'll get a better idea of how, um, what kind of player he's going to be. And also how he and Garland played together and how it all – I'm so glad Kobe Altman just didn't act like I want to be on ESPN and win the offseason and trade Jared Allen or something. Get the shooters. Let's see what happens. That's pretty much the motto for the season. Get the, get the shooters and let's see what happens. So, All right, here's number four, Terry. Nobody asked me, but dot, dot, dot. Cleveland fans need to step back and really appreciate how amazing the Tito Francona era is and has been. Number three, nobody asked me, but dot, dot, dot. The Joe Woods defensive scheme results in way too many blown coverages. Ugh. Number two, nobody asked me, but dot, dot, dot. When it comes to free agency in any sport, pay for the player, not the name. Mm -hmm. He's got these down, Terry. He's yeah, got he does. These are all Terry axioms. He'll, and he'll have one, my job in one more year, probably. <laughs> number one, nobody asked me, but dot, dot, dot. Have I brought my favorite horse, Case Keenum, out of the barn recently? <laughs> If the Browns could have just played him more in Baker's last year, Case would have ended up having a career better than Tom Brady. There you go. And, that, and that's just how it is. And Caleb says, did I miss any other good Plutoisms? Thanks for all you do, Terry, and keep up the amazing work. So oh. there you go. Thanks for putting all the thought into that, Caleb. That was a fun one. We appreciate that. Yeah, um, Caleb is Case Keenum's agent. <laughs> that's right. Speaking He's of, the Mark Bartlestein of, yeah, that's of right. Case Keenum. This is, this is, this is our uh, agent's uh, – edition of our, our podcast so <laughs> hey if you want to send us uh questions comments or some kind of top 10 list if you're up for it uh, you can hit us at sports at cleveland.com as usual and we'll try and get it on next week's show and also terry i don't think i mentioned your newsletter at the top oh i did yes i did go to cleveland.com slash newsletters and you will see terry's newsletter on there along with some other newsletter offerings terry's newsletter is free so I think that's it. We mentioned your uh, upcoming library thing at the top. I think we're good to go, right? Any last words? Well, well, I'm going to quote Les Levine. In his memory, of all the podcasts we've ever done, what is this one, David? This one is the most recent. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And with that, we will let you go. Thanks for listening. Have a great 4th of July, everybody. The weather looks like it's going to be really good in Northeast Ohio, so enjoy that. We will catch you next week on Terry's Talking.